found things confusing. And um, uh, I timed myself. I didn't do the entire presentation, but I got about two-thirds of the way through the slides in about a half hour. And that means that I'm going to try to take this very slowly and carefully, okay? Except I'm not going to read the abstract. Uh, I'm going to give you a pop quiz. Oh, my goodness, <laughs> a pop quiz. Um, and this is a mean trick. to You weren't expecting a quiz. Here's the question. A research paper computes a p-value of 0 0.45. How would you interpret this p-value? One, strong evidence for the null hypothesis. Two, strong evidence for the alternative hypothesis. Three, little or no evidence for the null hypothesis. And I'm reading these slowly because there's subtle differences between all of these, right? Four, little or no evidence for the alternative. Five, more than one answer above is correct. Six, I won't read six, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, now, I would ask you to answer this question. However, it is a trick question. Um, and I have to give a little history here. I put this in a serious um, talk about p-values and confidence intervals. And I made this mistake myself, and I presented it and I said, oops, none of these answers are right. None of these answers are right. Well, maybe six, okay? Um, because a p-value, let's go slowly here, it's a measure of the amount of evidence against the null hypothesis. The p-value is never a measure of evidence for any hypothesis, okay? And uh, People, if you get confused by the concept of p-value, there are a lot of people smarter than me that said it's not because you are confused, it's because the p-value is confusing. It's backwards in a bunch of different ways. A large p-value means little or no evidence against the null hypothesis, but you should not interpret that as lots of evidence for the null hypothesis. The reason for this? is that you may be dealing with a situation where the sample size is small and you have a lot of variation. So you have little, no, little or no evidence against any hypothesis. Okay, so large p-value, and we've known this for a while, but it bears repeating. A large p-value by itself is not very persuasive. Okay, um, now... Um, there are times when you want to try to demonstrate equivalence. And I'm, let me try to motivate this. Um, you're comparing something old to something new, all right? But um, there's issues associated with something old, all right? It has too much money. It costs too much money. It produces too many side effects. It breaks down too easily. It's something that people don't want to use. Okay, so you have something new, and it's something new. I want to emphasize this. You're trying to demonstrate equivalence, but it's something where on a side issue, you already know it's superior. It's a lot cheaper. It has a lot fewer side effects. It's more easily tolerable. Um, it's less likely to break down. Okay, so you never test equivalence unless there's some extra information that you have about superiority on some other scale or some other measure. All right, now with equivalence, we're looking at a Goldilocks condition. Okay, Goldilocks means not too big, not too small. All right, so you want to replace something with issues with something that is without issues. You want to substitute it, but only if they're measuring more or less the same thing. Okay, now I, I should have probably started with the definitions, and you've seen these definitions before, but again, because this material has the potential of seeming backwards or confusing, it helps to review these definitions, all right? The first one is a very fundamental one, the null hypothesis, and this is by tradition, but it's important to stick with this tradition, is a hypothesis that represents no change, no difference, or the status quo. It's the hypothesis that has the equal sign in it. Okay, type one error, that's rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. Um, and type two error, that's the reverse, accepting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. And type one error, that's a false positive 
type 2 error. That's a false negative, okay? Um, and let me give an example. If you work for the FDA and you're trying to decide whether a new drug should be available to the general public, there are two types of mistakes that you can make, all right? One is a type 1 error. Now, type 1 error is rejecting the null hypothesis, okay? So when you reject the null hypothesis in a new drug application, what you're saying is my new drug is superior to the placebo. So you reject the null hypothesis. You say it's superior, to, but it's not because the null hypothesis is true. So that means the drug's ineffective. It's no better than a sugar pill, but you're allowing it onto the market. Type 2 error that's where you accept the null hypothesis and you say, oh, this drug is worthless. It provides the same amount of impact that we get from a sugar pill. Don't put it on the market. But actually, it is effective. Okay? Now, there are two different types of errors. And I need to emphasize, sometimes we tend to put blinders on and we only worry about type 1 errors. And that's a problem. And FDA had this issue. Though I think it was the AIDS crisis in the 1990s. Um, 1980s and 90s. Uh, this was a disease that um, early on in its history, there were known, known uh, available treatments and people would get a diagnosis of AIDS and they'd commit suicide because they knew there was certain death. And uh, the FDA realized pretty quickly that um, keeping an effective drug off of the market is the worst possible thing you can do for a condition like AIDS. Type 2 error is far, far more serious in this setting. Okay, and maybe they had that appreciation before, but I think it really brought it into relief to look at what happens in a condition like AIDS. Um, I think it's changed a lot of how we tend to approach research, quite honestly. Looking for practical, relevant answers to all of your statistical questions? Join our Statistically Speaking membership program for monthly presentations like this one, as well as weekly Q&A sessions with our statistical support team. Visit theanalysisfactor.com for details. Happy analyzing!